Hardboiled Haggerty in the ring now. Today is the heyday of the pretty boy. Kowalski is called oh, Joe, the blind blind Stanley of Chicago. She likes it. Oh, boy, that can hurt. Right here at ringside while we go in for a riot of rough house that's lately called wrestling. The bird hanging on to an arm lock. As you gone, straining, and he breaks the hold, reverses the hold. And with a mighty bill, he sends the Baron right across the ring. Well, they are, fam. A man the size of the Baron, thrown like a fly by Yukon Eric. Takes Eric in a body scissors, and Eric Howell in a body scissors. And crash. Down came the big arms of Yukon Eric, and the Baron, completely mystified. He doesn't know how to handle this big man. Yukon Eric was born Eric Holmback on the 21st of April, 1916, close to Everett, then known as the City of Smokestacks, or the lumber capital of the world. Just a short distance away was the town of Monroe in Snohomish County in Washington State. It is here Eric was born in a year that Munro recorded its heaviest snowfall, a depth of over four feet. It looked just as bleak in Europe as the Battle of the Somme raged on in World War I. Eric was the only son to Eric and Lisa Holmbach. A generation earlier, the Holmbachs had left Sweden for a new life in the USA. To go with their new country, they had a new name, changing their name from Olsen to Holmbach. Holmback was the name of their family farm back in Sweden, and it meant bend in the river. Very appropriate for a family now living next door to Puget Sound. As seen in his family picture, young Eric was a strapping boy, and loved to show off his strength to his dad and many uncles. All of the men of the Holmback family made their living in the USA as lumberjacks, a profession Eric would later claim as his own. The Holmbach's men were known for their size and strength and had frequent physical battles with the local logging company goons over union rights. And despite it being the Roaring Twenties, for most, including the Holmbachs, it was still hard times. But the Holmbach family grew, and as it did, their modest prosperity allowed for the purchase of a family car. Eric spent his early school days at Wagner School District Number 40, he was a good and well-behaved student, as were all his sisters. At Munro Union High School, Eric played tackle for the high school football team. Another member of that team was fullback Lee Orr. He was to become a close friend of Eric for the next six years. Lee still remembers how Eric would always be standing on his toes in an effort to look even taller, and how together they would try to find summer work and got paid seven cents an hour. They would sometimes spend their hard-earned money at the old Munro movie theater, watching to be continued movies like Battling Buffalo Bill, starring the late Tom Tyler. They also both played on the high school winning basketball team. Lee states that the big city of Seattle was 50 miles away, and the boys with no means of public transport found it too far to travel. Consequently, they knew very little of the outside world and spent most of their days playing sports or hiking in the hills and swimming in the local lake. Lee lost touch with Eric after high school. Lee went on to become the US track and field quarter mile champion and ran in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, Germany, where he ran against the great Jesse Owen. Lee was to return to Germany eight years later, but this time with the US Army. Meanwhile, Eric went on to become the state wrestling champion and tried a little pro wrestling before also answering the call and joining the US Army. Eric was honorably discharged from the Army in 1946 with the rank of corporal. But it was during his service that he met Man Mountain Dean, who convinced Eric that upon his demob from the Army, he should take up the life of a professional wrestler, a profession he took to like a duck takes to water. I think he was one of the strongest men we ever had in the, in the world. Yukon Eric and, and Milo Steinborn were the two strongest wrestlers I ever wrestled. 
You can Eric would, would do a pullover. I saw him do this in Dallas, Texas. A pullover is lying on a bench and then having a weight and back and then and then reaching back and from from that position on a bench, bring it up and this is called a pullover. Four hundred pounds. And I've never seen anyone do more than 250. And I, I said, Eric, I said, that's unbelievable. He said, well, I can't do much, but I can do that. <laughs> I said, that's a hell of a lot, my friend. As a wrestler, I would rate Yukon Eric number one. He, he was, he had a great gimmick with his lumberjack thing, and and uh, he uh, was was an accomplished performer or wrestler, whatever how, whatever you guys want to call it. Uh, but I thought he was he was a great guy. I, it was, you know, the the little funny Elvis thing, and and weighing 210 pounds, wrestling 240, 50, up to 300 pound wrestlers. He thought I was a, a courageous little guy, and admired me for that. I, I'm assuming that he admired me for that because we stayed in touch and talked with each other on the phone and stuff for 10, 12 years, and he was a great guy. Eric, he's got a 58-inch chest that when he takes a deep breath and it's fully expanded is 67 and a half inches of chest. Man, there is a lot of man. He is so strong that he sometimes breaks holds just by uh, taking a deep breath. Uh, a fellow once said that in a small room uh, with him, uh, you'd never ask him to take a deep breath because he'd consume all the oxygen. <laughs> he's a big man. By the early 50s, come rain, wind, or snow, the image of the newly named Yukon Eric, bare-chested and barefooted, either driving his beloved convertible or walking the streets of the town he was appearing in, was a common promotional event. Yukon Eric was really colorful. I was wrestling in Quebec and Montreal, and it was 25 below zero. And Yukon is running around with short sleeves that lumberjack plaid type shirt, and he's running around like the weather's not even bothering him. And I remember a funny incident. One time, he went down to buy a new Cadillac convertible because he put the top down in a freezing winter, and he had these big 20 plus inch arms hanging out the window. And he goes down, and he's got $5 bills, $1 bills, 6,000 of them. I think in those days you buy a new Cadillac for $6,000. And he brings in a bundle with these 6,000 bills practically. And here's all the salesmen. He's got them down on the floor counting the money. So he really knew how to make them remember him. I'll, I'll never forget him. I was driving down the damn road one time and, and there's Yukon and he's got a He's got a flat and he's got a Cadillac and he's got his great big arms hanging out the damn door. He's got this Cadillac convertible and he's got a flat tire. tire. And he said he didn't have a jack. He said, Haggerty, well, I lift the car. Will you just put the tire on? I said, oh, God damn it, I can't believe it. He lift the goddamn car up? I'm, I'm sorry, the darn car. He lift the darn car. I slipped the tire on. <laughs> he's something else. He's a very strong guy, a very likable guy. He would run outside after his match with his bag in his hand Everything, all his clothes under his arms. He'd be in his tights, short tights, boots, and socks, and he'd run out to his car, which was a convertible, the top down, and here it is below freezing, and he'd drive off in the freezing weather with, with all his, only his boots and trunks. The other story that I heard that I thought was very funny, uh, some, some of the wrestlers got together, and wrestlers were well known for pulling pranks on each other, which is known in the wrestling world as ribs. Several of them got together one time, and at the, at the time, Yukon Eric lived in a trailer out in this open, it was a lot of land he lived on. And several of the boys pulled up to the trailer, hooked it up to their truck, and pulled it off. They thought when Yukon Eric came home, he'd be all upset, you know, he'd be wondering whatever happened to his trailer. 
So Yukon drives up, and they were watching from behind the trees. Yukon drives up, gets out of his car, never missed a beat. He walked to the steps that led up to the trailer, walked up the steps, and stepped down like he was walking right into the trailer. He went, walked around the trailer, went over to the refrigerator like he was opening the refrigerator, and he's pantomiming all this stuff. He evidently knew that they were pulling a prank on him. He went through everything just as if the trailer was still there. Took a drink out of the refrigerator, closed it, started drinking it. He went in the bathroom. He did all these things and never missed a beat. Went back up down the steps, got in his car and left. And, and he actually what he did, he reversed the joke on the wrestlers and they put the trailer back and he came back later and it was back. But I thought that was a funny story about Yukon Eric, how, just how sharp he was. It was while on one of his many trips to Toronto, Canada, that he met a young teenage girl, many years his junior. He would have fallen in love, and soon after, he whisked her away to southern Georgia, where they were married with just a few close friends in attendance. They would have had three children, a boy called Eric and two daughters. But Eric was to keep his personal life very secret. He spent most of his time on the road wrestling all comers. One ongoing feud was with Killer Kowalski. In fact, Kowalski got the name Killer after one of his 15 fights against Yukon. The match we had in Montreal, had a match with Yukon Eric, and uh, in the match, now, now Yukon Eric had a bad, bad color for our ears, two of them. In the match, I knocked, body slammed and knocked him down. I tied his leg in a rope. Oh, the second rope is torn underneath the bottom rope. And he, so, so I climb, I used to do it for a finish. I used to climb a top turnbuckle, top rope, jump down across the guy's chest. That was one of my most famous moves, knee drop off the top rope. So I did it to Yukon Eric. But the referee's underneath me untying his leg. As I'm coming down, Yukon Eric saw me come in, he turned away from me. I turned in midair, and my shin bone scraped it, so tight scraped his cheek. I hit the ear and ripped right off the side of his head. There's photographs of him with just a lobe left. And his ear caught and rolled right across the ring. So this was a Wednesday, a Friday, that the office get paid. They paid every Friday. So as I walked in, and Eddie Quinn, the promoter, says, uh, been to the hospital? For what? What do you mean, for what, you dumb Pollock? Go to the hospital, apologize. For what? I've had injured other rest. I never apologized in my life. So he said to the officer, take him to the hospital. It's only a block away. So we went to the hospital, we went up to the second floor, I looked over, I see a bunch of people in the room there. Where he was at. So as I started walking away, the office guy run over this. Vlada Kowalski, at that time it was called Vlada Kowalski, it's Walter. Vlada is Walter in Polish. He's, he's out there. So I said, oh boy. So I walked over, stood in that doorway. Looked across the room, here's Yukon Eric sitting at the edge of the bed, feet on the floor, and he's, his head is bound. Pounded around and around, bandaged around, bandaged. The first thought that came to my mind was Humpty Dumpty sitting on the wall. So I started laughing. Next day in the paper, Montreal Gazette. Vlada Kowalski visits Yukon American Hospital and laughs at him. On the following Wednesday, Montreal for him again. People throw them garbage and junk at me, everything like that. You're an animal, you're a monster, you're a killer. That was it. The name stuck. Killer Kowalski. Oh, no! Yukon Eric was a big fan favorite wherever he wrestled. In 1953 in Chicago, in a tag team match against Sky High Lee and the Mighty Atlas, Eric's partner Vern Gagne sat back to enjoy the fun as Eric showed off his incredible prowess as a wrestler. Referee in a wrestling match for Yukon Eric was really tough because he was one tough wrestler. I don't care who, what anybody says, he was tough. Seven days a week, if he wrestled seven days a week or one day a week, he was real tough. And I mean, he was a machine. <laughs> Eric is clobbering him and now he clobs the referee. Eric has gone mad because he can get uh, disqualified for that. There he goes again. 
I think Eric's gone out of his mind. Well, outside Eric the ring, he was all right. But inside the ring, man, he'd give you hell. Pardon my French. <laughs> I mean, it'd push you. You know, there wasn't too many rules in them days. They'd get away with quite a bit. It would be my, one of my tougher matches. I would always get disqualified. I, I couldn't take this guy. I'd get disqualified. That, was, that would be the easy way out, <laughs> is to get disqualified. Because actually, the name was Hard Boiled Haggerty, so they expected me to be tough and rough. So I'd just say, boy, like, to wrestle this guy, like, you know, it's like wrestling Luthez. Not according to Yukon. He hit the referee twice. That's an automatic suspension. Going to need some policemen to get this guy out, and they're going to need about 40. You got Eric lost his head. Hits him again. Man alive. This guy's really gone mad. That's a place in an uproar. Blood streaming down from his. But Eric runs out of the ring, and Yukon goes right after him. you know. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Rub there. Timber. Sky High Lee looks at him. <laughs> know what to do with his Eric. Old Nelson on him. Well, we'll try again, says Eric. to his wrist lock. You can see what's going on. There's no use for me to talk. In a Broadway musical, Eric it was written, rise up and look around you, and you'll see where you are. In 1965, Eric but must have Eric done just there. that. And what he saw, he did not like. He was now totally alone. His wife, through sheer loneliness, had left him and had taken the three children with her. 
Eric was now living at the AMB trailer site in Tonawanda, New York. And on January the 16th, as he drove into Cartersville, Georgia, as fate would have it, he spotted the very church that he was married in. He had only moments earlier called his old wrestling buddy, Sputnik Monroe. Now, on the day of uh, Yukon Eric's demise, he called me and uh, I told him I lived on the north side of Atlanta in, in Chambly. He was coming from Florida. And uh, I didn't exactly give him any, any directions or anything. I just told him where I lived, you know, give him the address. And, and uh, our conversation wasn't leading to, towards him coming out. However, I did ask him, you know, he said, well, I don't think I have time. You know, he was going back to, to Toronto and uh, so I said, okay, well, it'd be great to see you. And he said, well, maybe we can work it out, okay? And then uh, the next morning, they found out who he was and everything, and the sheriff's department come over and told me that he had committed suicide. And they, uh, uh, well, I, he always drove around, regardless what, what the temperature was, with top down on the Cadillac, he pulled in to, to a, a church, I guess, to die on sacred ground and pull the trigger on himself. Very, very tragic. Eric had, in fact, come to realize that his life was now going through severe emotional changes and that his life would never again be the way it had been. Sadly, Eric could neither understand nor cope with this new reality. What I know about Yukon Eric shooting himself is that he was very depressed. And I don't know that that was very well known until that actually happened. Uh, as a fan at the time, I knew of Yukon Eric. I, I saw his matches on television, and for all I knew, he was a big success. However, the newspapers brought out later that he was battling some depression, some personal problems. And it's just amazing that someone you see as being so successful in life would have problems that we don't know about and would resort to taking their own life. Which is terrible because he was, it was really a loss because Frank Tunney and, and, and uh, Tom Toronto and myself really liked the guy, we loved the guy. We thought he was a super, super man and a wonderful, super guy to be around. And we were always, you know, if at the slightest excuse, we would go to lunch with him or something because he's a good guy. And not all of them are. <laughs> you know, looking back on on uh, Yukon, Eric, he, he, he wasn't much of a, a talker or, you know, if he said something, it was right down to the bone and didn't do a lot of talking. He was just one hell of a guy. Please refer to your manual. 